This is part two of antiplatelet medications, and I'll be starting off with the P2Y12 inhibitors. The P2Y12 inhibitors predictably inhibit the P2Y12 ADP receptor on the platelet surface. Although it seems that most physicians are not familiar with the formal name of this particular medication class, they may instead know them as the theanopyridines, since most fall into that particular chemical classification. These include clopidogrel, commonly known by the brand name of Plavix, Prasugrel, which is occasionally known by its brand name of Effient, and the rarely used Ticlopidine. Theanopyridines are all based upon this structure. Other common features of the theanopyridines include oral formulations only. They are all prodrugs, which require in vivo biotransformation into the active drug, and they all irreversibly inhibit platelet aggregation. In addition, there is one non-theanopyridine P2Y12 inhibitor, which is called ticagrelor. Ticagrelor is a nucleoside analog with a chemical structure similar to that of adenosine. Compared to theanopyridines, ticagrelor binds reversibly to the P2Y12 receptor, has a quicker onset of action, and a shorter duration of action. Thus, it needs to be given twice daily, which is its major disadvantage compared to the other P2Y12 inhibitors. What are the common indications for the P2Y12 inhibitors? Acute coronary syndrome, in addition to aspirin, anticoagulation, and plus-minus a GP2B3A inhibitor. The specific choice of drug depends on the situation. If receiving PCI, that is, the patient is getting angioplasty and a stent, the general preference is for either prasugrel or ticagrelor. If the patient is receiving fibrinolytics, the preference is for clopidogrel. And if receiving neither PCI nor fibrinolytics, the preference is also for clopidogrel. Clopidogrel is also used for secondary prevention of non cardioembolic stroke or TIA, but only by itself and not in combination with aspirin. Combining clopidogrel and aspirin in this situation results in no improvement in stroke reduction but does result in an increase in clinically relevant bleeding. Finally, for secondary prevention of cardioembolic stroke, or TIA, clopidogrel plus aspirin is used in patients who are not candidates for oral anticoagulation for reasons other than bleeding risk, since the risk of bleeding from clopidogrel plus aspirin is similar to that from anticoagulation. Keep in mind that these indications are very fluid based on evolving data and could become obsolete with the next big clinical trial. There are also local institutional preferences which may differ slightly, and the cost of some of these drugs may be an additional consideration in some areas. A common question which comes up regarding use of these drugs is how long should they be used after PCI? Patients who have received a bare metal stent absolutely must be treated for at least one month to prevent instant thrombosis. Patients who have received a drug-eluting stent absolutely must be treated for at least three months. In the absence of a contraindication, such as bleeding or non-elective surgery, evidence supports continuing treatment for 12 months, irrespective of choice of stent. And some cardiologists prefer treating beyond 12 months, but there is currently insufficient evidence to broadly recommend this. Some additional notes about the P2Y12 inhibitors. Clopidogrel has a longer onset of action compared to prasugrel and ticagrelor, and may be less effective at preventing cardiovascular morbidity, but is associated with less bleeding. Prasugrel is contraindicated in patients who are 75 years or older, and in those with a history of stroke or TIA, as a consequence of observed higher rates of intracranial bleeding in these patients. It also needs to be dose-reduced or avoided altogether in patients of low body weight. The P2Y12 inhibitors increase the risk of major bleeding in patients undergoing urgent coronary artery bypass surgery. The common approach to this issue is to withhold the drug for five to seven days prior to surgery. However, there is some variability in this practice and there is insufficient evidence to make any specific recommendation. Finally, I mentioned earlier that cyclopidine is rarely used. That's because it's associated with neutropenia and a potentially fatal hematologic condition called thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, which I will discuss later in this series.
The last aspect of P2Y12 inhibitors to discuss is that of clopidogrel resistance, also known as clopidogrel non-responsiveness or high on treatment platelet reactivity. This refers to a lack of clinically meaningful inhibition of platelet activity after taking clopidogrel. Proposed etiologies of this include variations in the metabolism of the drug into its active form, as well as drug-drug interactions. Several years ago, there was a lot of concern regarding some modest quality evidence that proton pump inhibitors may interfere with the action of clopidogrel. But based on the current body of evidence, this seems to most likely not be true. However, it remains controversial, and some physicians may still show preference away from concurrently prescribing clopidogrel and PPIs. The generally accepted clinical presentation of clopidogrel resistance is simple. Recurrent thrombotic cardiovascular events despite treatment. To me, this seems to be overly inclusive, since a recurrent event is not necessarily indicative of there being no meaningful platelet inhibition. After all, patients on aspirin still get recurrent events all the time. Nevertheless, that's the definition some of the literature uses. Despite the fact that this sounds like it should be a big deal, routine screening of patients for clopidogrel resistance is surprisingly not currently recommended since it hasn't yet been shown to lead to any benefit. The next class of medications is the GP2B3A inhibitors. Recall that the 2B3A receptor serves as part of a bridge, along with fibrinogen and von Willebrand factor, to attach activated platelets to one another. Inhibitors essentially prevent these receptors from doing that job. As mentioned at the beginning of the video, there are three members in this class. Eptifibotide and tyrofiban are relatively small, non-antibody inhibitors, while apsiximab is the fab fragment of a chimeric human murine monoclonal antibody. All three of these drugs are given via continuous IV infusion. Initially, when they were first developed, the 2B3A inhibitors had a larger role in the management of ACS, but with the subsequent development of P2Y12 inhibitors, their role has become somewhat reduced. In addition, the current body of literature on them is quite dense and looks at very specific combinations of drugs in specific situations. Generally speaking, the current indications for 2B3A inhibitors include use at the time of PCI in an NSTEMI if either the chosen concurrent anticoagulant is unfractionated heparin and the patient receives pretreatment with clopidogrel, or if the patient does not receive adequate pretreatment with any P2Y12 inhibitor irrespective of choice of anticoagulant. In addition, they can also be used in unstable angina or NSTEMI prior to PCI if there is evidence of ongoing ischemia irrespective of the choice of anticoagulation and P2Y12 inhibitor. In practice, I currently find their use prior to PCI to be quite uncommon. The next drug to discuss is dipyridamol. It has multiple mechanisms of action. First, as a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, it inhibits PDE5 and, to a lesser extent, PDE3. This raises platelet CAMP and CGMP with a secondary effect of decreasing platelet responsiveness to ADP. It also inhibits the reuptake of adenosine by red blood cells, which leads to higher concentrations of plasma adenosine and subsequent platelet inhibition. Dipyridamol also acts as an antioxidant, which scavenges the free radicals, which normally inactivate cyclooxygenase, thereby enhancing PGI2 synthesis by the endothelium. And finally, it acts as a coronary vasodilator, an effect not directly related to hemostasis, but is related to its use in myocardial nuclear imaging, where it is marketed under the trade name persantine, as in a persantine stress test. Despite all of those mechanisms, for the purposes of preventing hemostasis, dipyridamol is not very frequently used. In fact, I've never personally seen it used outside of a combination with aspirin in a medication marketed under the trade name Agronox. And Agronox is only used for the secondary prevention of non cardioembolic stroke, or TIA. Because it has an equivalent effectiveness as clopidogrel for this indication, and because Agronox is a twice-daily medication with a relatively common side effect of headache, most physicians prefer prescribing clopidogrel in this situation. The final medication to discuss is Solostazole. This acts as a selective PDE3 inhibitor 
which increases CAMP, leading to platelet inhibition and vasodilation. Its indication is primarily for symptomatic improvement in peripheral artery disease, that is, it reduces claudication. There is also limited data supporting possible use for secondary stroke prevention in Asian populations, though at least in the U.S. I have never seen it used for this reason. Thalastosol may take four weeks for symptomatic benefit in patients with claudication, so patients should not write it off if they don't see uh, any improvement after just a few days. And finally, it is considered to be contraindicated in congestive heart failure. So those are the antiplatelet medications in current use. Here's a table summarizing the medications, their mechanisms, and their common indications. I'm not going to go through the table line by line, as you can obviously pause the video if you'd like to review it on your own. That concludes this two-part video on antiplatelet medications. Sorry it was on the longer side, but it's kind of a big topic, similar to the next one on anticoagulation.